And of an era at the newspaper of record. All the news that's fit to print. Mark Thompson is stepping down as CEO of the New York Times. Now, remember, this is the commercial side, the New York Times company, as opposed to the editorial side. <clears throat> he was previously the director general of the BBC, and he joined the Times in 2012. When he did so, an opinion piece in his own paper asked if he was the right man for the job. Eight years later, digital subscriptions have gone from 500,000 to more than 5 million. The share price is up more than 400%, and digital revenue has passed print revenue for the first time. Mark Thompson, CEO of the failing New York Times, <laughs> joins me now. Um, the failing New York Times, uh, says the president. Well, not so much, Richard, really. I mean, certainly, if you look at the economics of the of the company, we, we've, we've uh, been successful in the last few years in, in really proving out a model where, whereby you invest in journalism. We've got more than 300 more people in our newsroom than when I started. Invest in journalism, uh, get smart about how you package it and sell it as a digital product on smartphones and so on. And you can generate the loyalty and the subscribers, which help pay for more journalism. So we've we've managed to get ourselves into a virtuous circle, and we're one of the few news organisations to do that. The as as the CEO, what do you think was the one thing I read your article about? You, know, you came in with a cold, open eye from being an outsider. What was the one thing that you noticed and thought, "This is barking mad. I can change this in a minute." I just felt, but I have to say, I feel this about TV. As you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a TV guy. I did work with you at the BBC, Richard. But the, the just like our own industry, like like TV, I felt that the newspaper industry was it was trapped in a psychology of the limits of the possible. You know, that they, they didn't really think that you could break out from, you know, a million, million and a half subscribers. Um, we're at, you know, um, uh, more than six million subscribers now. Um, we've set a goal of 10 million. I think the T New York Times ultimately could could reach 10, 20, 30 million subscribers. And there's something about just raising your ambitions. In some ways, my ignorance about the American newspaper business, I think, helped me because I didn't have any of these self-imposed boundaries. And th th that's fascinating in its own right, isn't it? Because, objectively, one wouldn't appoint somebody as the CEO of a major Come particularly a, a gold standard who had no experience of that particular element of the industry. And not just that, Richard, I'd never worked for a day in my life before coming to New York Times in a for profit <laughs> company. I've been chief executive of both Channel 4 and the BBC in the UK, but those are both not for profit organizations. So it was my first my first day of true commercial life was the day I walked into the headquarters of the New York Times. But I think you know that, that that was at least I think part of the the point of that article. But but uh, it turns out that actually we've been a, a surprisingly good marriage, I'd say. And on this, you've kept your hands off the editorial to, to, to you know in the extent that one can. Um, but the New York Times is in the midst of the editorial, same editorial throws that we all are, which is conservative versus liberal, what to say. And when you lo lost the opinion page editor, did you spot the sign of a crisis, do you think? Well, I, look, I certainly think, I mean, um, that we're living through incredibly polarised times, um, particularly in the United States, very visceral polarised politics. That inevitably, in some ways, a news organisation should to some extent reflect the society it's, it's reporting on. And, and that comes into the building. I, I had incredible admiration for James Bennett as an editor. I think he did wonderful things, and he did broaden the range of voices at the time. But I'm afraid he did fall victim to what is a moment of, you know, great anger and great disagreement. We have to reflect that. I believe The New York Times should continue to publish a really broad... Um, really broad range of, of, of different opinions, including opinions from the right and the and the strongly held kind of you know right. further right. But nonetheless, it's a bumpy business, as as that episode demonstrated. Um, Mark, 
head of Channel 4, I'd forgotten about that one, but I certainly remember you were the DJ of the BBC when I think you, I, I was still there. Uh, uh, you were the DJ of the BBC, and now you've been the CEO of the New York Times. Um, you're barely in your 60s, so what is next? People of <laughs> your age, with your experience, and please do not try and flim-flam me otherwise, you do not go off to grow petunias and go fishing. You find me in my kitchen in northern New England, so, so I'll be doing a bit of cooking later on. So the, the domestic side of life I, I, I do like. But, um, look, I, I like big challenges. That should be fairly apparent. Um, that might come in the shape of another big executive job, but it might not. I'm, I'm interested in the puzzle of how you help organisations confront the present and the future, how you, how you change them, how you kind of unlock talent and innovation and creativity in organisations. That, that's my thing. And if I can help one or more right. organisations in the future, I'd love to do that. Well, we look forward in that role of helping others. We look forward to you coming on Crestman's Business once you've got a bit, maybe a bit more free time and uh, we can talk about the future of industry and the future of economics as it's going forward. Mark, good to have you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you, Richard. See you soon. God bless.